Okay, greetings from India again. Not as part of the organizers, but as the Indian scene, coal scene. Uh, I'd like to focus on <clears throat> three different aspects. India is not only a major coal country, but what happens in several other countries or continents in terms of coal and climate, India is also a key determinant. Because what happens in Australian coal depends to a large extent on India. Because Australian large expansion plans are dependent on Indian consumption of coal. Don't, steal, don't steal my talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm not talking about that, but we are working on that also. So India is very important in that sense that what happens to coal's future globally. Uh, in terms of, because uh, Kale started with the infographics, so in terms of coal in India, I'll just give some quick uh, figures. India is probably the third largest coal power producers and coal miner. Uh, we produce about 600 million tons of coal every year within India. The 800 million tons is the consumption, roughly 200 million tons, not tons, million tons, comes from outside. And uh, in India, out of the total installed power capacity, that is the electricity, not the total energy, because in our kind of countries, Bangladesh will be even uh, skewed figure, even more skewed figure. But in India, the total primary energy basket, as electricity, we consume only 16%. So 16% is the contribution of the total primary basket in energy, which comes from electricity. The rest are either coal as it, or biomass, or other energies, like gas, oil, other things. So when you talk about coal power, so electricity plants are a small fraction, but a major part of the resistance struggles in India are around electricity plants. Around 68% of the electricity in India comes from coal, the electricity, of total uh, electricity consumption, and around 70% of the struggles, people's struggles against any destructive projects are around power plants. Many of them are against coal power plants, coal mining, some are against big nuclear power plants and in Indian government, anything they plan is they plan in big scales, not as big as China. Like China tries to catch up with the US, India tries to catch up with China. So these are the catching up game that we play in our region. So today we have, by the official estimate, around uh, 117 billion tons of coal reserves up to 300 meters, because as you go deeper, you get more reserves, proven reserves, not the 300 billion ton that is estimated. And we have in India around uh, 200,000 megawatts of electricity inst install capacity from coal out of 333,000. 300, that is the total electricity capacity. In India, the nuclear issue, I am part of anti-nuclear movement also. Let me just give me for a minute. I am uh, part of a India Climate Justice Platform, I am founder member. I am also part, uh, one of the founder members of National Alliance of Anti-Nuclear Movement. But we have a very large network which works against any dirty projects, including coal, nuclear and big hydro. Uh, partly uh, this Beyond Copenhagen works in the knowledge domain, but I am, uh, I call myself a knowledge activist who is also deeply involved in the ground level resistance. and. As you have heard from Professor Muhammad, Anu Muhammad, we also get <coughs> police threats, get arrested, sometimes gets beaten up, not very severely, but sometimes get beaten up. So that kind of scenario, that's part of the game. So what I was telling earlier, in India, what is happening in coal, that will I'll focus on quickly, a little bit, then there is a change that has started. And there are three factors which, is, which are determining that change. I'll also focus a little bit on that. And there, very little on what is India's connection uh, in the region at least. Because whenever we work in India or different areas, we see that we cannot work in an isolated fashion in India. Though in the South Asian region, India is the dominant economy, dominant population country. We have 1.32 billion people in India now. But because three factors connect South Asian nations together, one is the Himalayas, Second of the three seas, Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal. And the third factor is the South Asian monsoon, which determines what happens to 85% of South Asian population, whether they are able to grow crops, whether they face drought, whether they face tremendous floods, 
All these are determined by these three factors, connected factors. So we, when we work, we work in the South Asian context. Though I am located physically, geographically within India. As I was saying, India has the third largest installed power capacity now. It was fourth. Very uh, recently it has become third. Though per person consumption is not very high. It's much higher than Bangladesh. Bangladesh consumes around 300 kilowatt hours of power per person per year. And we consume around 1000. Though that's very low compared to Germany which is around 8000 and US around 12000. But still that's a substantial amount. But something might surprise you which is which goes contrary to Indian government's presentation outside India because in all climate negotiations in all negotiation the Indian government has said we need more carbon space that is more cap more space to emit carbon dioxide because a very large percentage of our population don't have electricity which is true around 300 million people which is close to the total US population don't have electricity today but India, this is the third year running when India is electricity surplus. In the market, the electricity is there. Electricity is not being sold. 25,000 capacity coal power plants are shut down <coughs> because there is no buyer for that, that produce electricity. 90,000 of coal power plants, which were in the pipeline, which you call, in different stages, that have been deferred because of three factors. The one factor, as I said, is India is a surplus, is just one factor. There are other factors. So, the overall Indian scenario is on the one hand, Indian government and the corporates are still gunning for more coal mining and coal power plants. And the new government that came in three and a half years ago, they said very clearly from the that time's annual mining, coal mining, of 560 million tons within five years and that 560 million tons capacity has come over last 170 years. In India, large scale coal mining started in 1874. Uh, and after uh, independence, we increased very rapidly. So more than 100 years of capacity, built up capacity, they said we'll double it in the next five years. That is not going to happen. Don't get scared. That's not going to happen. But that was the target that was, that was de determining how much money is pumped into coal in spite of the fact that this is the third year, 2017 is the third year when India is officially electricity surplus, not energy surplus, not that every Indian has electricity, but officially the amount of electricity is there in the market, there are not enough buyers for that electricity. And that's one reason what Professor Mohammed said, that India is trying to open up new market for both its coal and electricity in the neighboring areas. We are building. Indian companies are building 10 HVDC lines of 400 kV to Nepal and Bangladesh. We are building dams in Bhutan, keeping Indian market in mind. Without taking this into cognizance, the Indian electricity sector is saturated. As I said, 333 or 34,000 megawatt is installed capacity ready. 92,000 megawatt more is in the pipeline. Apart from that has been deferred. 28,000 megawatts are nearly ready. So with this situation, coal now, in a sense in India, both the expansion of mining, coal mining plant, and the expansion plans of coal power plants have slowed down. That has not affected our uh, planning because recently, this year, June, the Indian National Planning Body, we have demoli uh, our government has demolished the earlier planning commission which was somewhat democratic and they have made a very narrow uh, bureaucratic body called Niti Ayo, policy uh, body, which is now determining what happens to different areas in India. So June 27, they uploaded the national energy policy. No one in the nation was consulted. We were following up for the last two years because the energy policy was being framed. Even we were surprised when it was uploaded on June 27 evening and they said within July 14 everybody has to give their inputs and this was not published this was only on the internet 78 percent of India is unconnected with internet uh, 30 percent as I said do not have even electricity to run any internet uh, facilities and people were expected to respond to this energy policy were again ignoring what is actually happening on the ground 
we have projected, we means our government has projected huge increase in coal, in nuclear, in big hydro. <coughs> so that's the kind of undemocratic process that goes on even now in India and it has increased, though we claim officially that we are the biggest democracy in the world. Uh, in the numbers, we are obviously the biggest, 1.32 billion, nobody has except China, and China is not democracy. So we are the biggest democracy in numbers, but that's the democratic process. But let me come back to coal again. What is happening in coal today? There are three factors, as I said. One, of course, is that coal and coal power is in the entire context of electricity is surplus today. There are two reasons for that. It's not that, I'm repeating this, it's not that every Indian family has electricity. 300 million Indian people don't have electricity today. But there is the available electricity in the market is priced such that most of these 300 million people are not able to buy that electricity. Because the Indian government and most government in the world are putting electricity and energy as commodities to be bought and sold not as life support system, not as essential services. So they have provided the ele electricity in the market. People, there are a lot of people who are not able to buy that. The several state level distribution companies, which were earlier mostly government owned companies or publicly owned companies, they are bankrupt. There, for, there are many reasons, I will not go into details of that. The third factor is that there is tremendous amount of resistance. As I said, there are, as of now, 118 active resistance groups against both coal mining and coal power plants. I'm not talking about the nuclear and big dams and others. 118 big rail resistances against coal mining and coal power plants. In uh, Andhra Pradesh, which is going to be a big nuclear and big coal state, there are three big struggles. In one, in Prakasham district, two people lost their lives. That 3,000 megawatt power plant was stopped. So we lost two people, but that power plant was stopped. In a, in a Himalayan state, they tried to build, a, they not tried, they built up without the permission, without the official permission, a 100 megawatt captive power plant. After tremendous protests, that had to be shut down and dismantled. So these are kind of successes people are having. But the resistances, <coughs> what we are finding, the resistances are now also trying to connect up with larger, uh, larger resistance bodies, not only in our region, but globally. Because we need, what we are seeing is, though the World Bank and uh, ADB and all, they are saying we are not funding coal anymore, after a lot of pressure, they are actually funding surreptitiously two ways where the coal is supported. One is, they are supporting the infrastructure for coal power evacuation. ADB has Asian Development Bank, has gone into big, big state into funding the evacuation structures, the high voltage power transmission lines, which will evacuate power from coal power plants. The ultra mega power plant, the India's first ultra mega power plant, 4,000 megawatt plant, India had 16 such plants in paper present, uh, being planned and being executed. This is my study uh, written in 2012 on that. Uh, two very quick uh, points. In Indian kind of economy, in Bangladesh and Nepal and everywhere, this is true, where in India, roughly 7% of the workforce are in organized sector. 93% are in the unorganized sector. There is no security of job or earning or anything. So in that scenario, a job, even in a very dirty coal power plant or a mine, is extremely attractive. So all the time, the corporations and the governments we are projecting this, that we are not only providing you electricity, this is a basic service, but we are also providing jobs. Like this 4,000 megawatt coal power plant, they were claiming they will provide 700 jobs, and that's a big attraction. So when we started, we found, and this is a study I wrote in 2012, June, we found that though they will be providing maybe 700 jobs, very few are local, but more importantly, this coal power plant has actually displaced 11,000 self-reliant, prosperous livelihoods. This is a coastal area where the coastal fishermen, the marine fish workers are very, very well off because marine catch was good. Once this power plant came up, this is using not only 13 million tons of coal every year it is burning, it's putting up huge amount of hot water into the Gulf of Kutch. So the fish catch has been destroyed. 
they have bridge for their intake and outfall channels so the very productive creeks mangroves and the reef system that has been destroyed roughly 11000 fish workers who are well off they have been they have lost their livelihoods and then there are the one i don't know what it is called here the fruit called we call sapota that cultivation has been destroyed the uh, small scale agriculture and that is an area where sweet water is available only in a very narrow belt and that's the belt these power plants came up two of them side by side and they have taken this water out so agriculture is destroyed marine fishing which is very very remunerative that is destroyed and horticulture is destroyed so we highlighted that that by giving 700 jobs forget about the environmental consideration that will come but you have destroyed 11,000 self-reliant prosperous livelihoods so on balance who loses who gains and this kind of arguments now in our kind of economy is extremely important to build up because otherwise this attraction that okay we are losing something but we will be gaining jobs good jobs well paying jobs for the young people engineers and all so we are into that but I'll end by saying this in India now these three factors as I said one is the resistance very strong resistance one reason is India is very densely populated not as dense as Bangladesh but much more dense than most Euro all European countries and US and all 18 times as dense as Brazil so that's the kind of population density so any big destructive project you do you actually displace a large number of people not only from the land but also from the livelihoods second is the economics <coughs> and end by saying these three highlighting these three that today by government estimate every kilowatt hour of coal power plant every unit of coal power cost around 3 rupees 30 paisa to produce any new plant not the old plants where amortization has taken place today in india in many places new solar energy plants cost the power production produce power cost 2 rupees 60 to 2 rupees 90 paisa so even by the economic interest many big coal power producers are switching to big solar power plants but that's not the kind of transition that we want as i started saying we want a just transition because this solar and wind powers are distributed and people have a right to claim that power themselves not the same big corporations which produce coal power and nuclear power and big hydro power the same corporation will capture every solar and wind power and sell you at whatever price they get so that is another phase of struggle that we are coming into. So I keep saying to my northern NGO friends that the energy transition that we visualize is not just transitioning from coal, oil and gas. Not gas for Bangladesh is a very low consumer. It's not just from fossil fuels to solar and wind. It's also, a par it has to be a paradigm shift. It has to be energy sovereignty, energy right. Because if you allow today the people's energy resources which are renewable energies has a inherently democratic character coal oil gas uranium are very concentrated very highly concentrated energy source and they are not available everywhere solar wind they are available almost everywhere people's needs are distributed everywhere so if you allow today this distributed decentralized power or energy availability to be captured by the same corporate houses same capitalist groups same concentrated capital then tomorrow in the years to come you will have to face bigger troubles because unless we look at our energy consumption paradigm also this intensely energy energy intensive consumption intensive civilizations we have to change our transition has to go into the other direction so my appeal to my northern friends northern uh, ex minister green party northern ngos is that please focus not only on the energy transition from fossil fuels, it's not only a fuel switching, it has to be energy rights, energy sovereignty, people's interest in the center. Thank you very much.